Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hey everyone, Michelle here with another great business to discuss on this episode of the Real Money, Real Business podcast. Today's guest is Prudence, and she is selling her Amazon FBA business on the Empire Flippers Marketplace. So welcome to the show, Prudence, and how are you today? I'm all right, Michelle. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm glad to have you on this call, and I'm looking forward to talking more about your business. But before we dive in, let's go over a brief summary of it. It's an Amazon FBA business in the home, pet care, beauty, and children's niches created in March 2015. The average monthly revenue for the business is $51,163, and it makes an average of $9,428 per month in net profit. For everyone listening, you can visit empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for listing 55464 to learn more about this business, or you can unlock this listing to start your due diligence if you're interested in purchasing this asset. So now that I've given a general overview of the business, let's see what's included. Two Seller Central accounts with 19 active and five inactive ASINs, domains with site and content files, trademarks, a Helium 10 account, social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram with Hootsuite access, supplier contracts and relationships, SOPs, a VA for website IT support, and graphics and licensed media files. So Prudence, now let's hear from you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in building and running online businesses? Sure. Well, I'm actually a stay-at-home mom, and previous to setting this up, I had no previous experience in running an online business. I previously worked in finance management and was involved in marketing and business development. So after having kids, I wanted to find something I could work on and build from home, but gave me the flexibility so that I could be present for our kids. So I tried different online business ideas, such as affiliate marketing and mobile apps, before I came across Amazon. So in terms of my idea on starting this business, is really my involvement with the online business that led me to Amazon. The reason why I stuck to Amazon, because I really like the platform, the idea of selling physical items so I could do this from home. And the niche that I found, you know, I really liked that niche. And that was really helped me start this because I felt that I could do make a difference there. OK, great. So how does your business primarily make its money? Is there one SKU that you have that performs really well or is it sort of across the board? It is a, lots of different SKUs, actually. We repre- we're in, as you said earlier on, we're in sort of the children, beauty, home, pets department sort of categories. And there are SKUs within each of those categories that do really well. Obviously, some do better than others, but they've all performed well. They have an average of about four and a half stars. Some of them have over a thousand reviews. And The nature of our products is that there's similar products, sort of variations of each other, which are offered across different categories because their uses are applicable across these different categories in slightly different ways. And I think it is that actually has helped us do quite well. Well, it's fantastic that you guys have had such great success. So, you know, we see a lot of different reasons why sellers decide to, you know, sell their businesses. So why have you decided to sell? Well, we weren't actually thinking of selling you know, a few weeks back, but we were then approached by an interested party, and this basically got us thinking. This particular discussion didn't progress any further, but it effectively made us realize that it was actually a good point in our lives to sell up. Our kids, we have twins, will be leaving for college shortly, so we will be for the first time in 18 years without kids or the need to be there for them every day. So we thought this would be a great time to take a pause in our working lives, to travel while COVID permitting, and you know, take a break before starting again. Yeah, that's completely understandable. So is there anything that you've learned from this business that you would apply to future businesses? Is that something you're interested in? Or what did you learn that didn't work or did work? Well, 
I think that in terms of what worked or what we definitely would apply for future businesses, because this is something that we will think of doing once we've taken our pause, is research. That's it. In the sense that in-depth, thorough research is absolutely essential in understanding what customers want, what they dislike, etc. The customers where is what sales are dependent on, so appreciating what their needs is absolutely fundamental. I found that once products are designed according to what customers are looking for and not necessarily what we think they should be looking for, that these actually work that much better. Yeah, that's a very, very valid point. So can you tell me where does the majority of your traffic come from? Yes, the majority or pretty much all of the traffic actually comes from the Amazon platform itself. We do advertise on Amazon's platform and have brand stores set up. In terms of other space like social media, we do have various social media accounts and we do make regular posts on Facebook and Twitter, really using relevant posts from that we find from articles elsewhere. I'm basically not a social media expert. So the efforts here is sort of fairly minimal and basic and it's really just to maintain a presence. In terms of websites, we've not done SEO or Google Ads, so I'm sure more could have been done there. Sorry, just sum this up. It is really Amazon is where the majority of traffic comes from. All right, that's great. If you were to keep your business, what are some ways that you would try to grow it? Gosh, there's so many things one could do. I mean, we spend about eight hours a week, so I'm sure that there's a lot more that could have been done. So firstly, as mentioned, social media definitely focus on how to drive traffic, you know, how to promote brands on the platforms. Whether I would have done it myself or hired an expert, I don't know, but this is definitely an area. Website SEO as well, to try and get the brands more prominent on Google. Another area is targeting multiple audiences. Many of our brands, apart from the specific use that they're wanted for, it is really the way that they're packaged and designed is also for some of these products are also for the gift market. You know, they're attractively packaged, nice to opening experience. So this could be another market that be targeted. So, you know, birthdays, baby showers, holiday season, etc. Another interesting angle is that some of our products can be considered as high-end luxury items. So by promoting to a more affluent audience could also increase sales. Brick and mortar stores is another area that we would have con- looking at, well, considering looking at next year. We haven't done this so far because we are based in the UK and it's easier to expand the brick and mortar stores in the US by having an LLC, which we would need to set up. We used to sell in Amazon Europe, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, but we stopped that because of Brexit, because we could no longer fulfill from the UK. But what we were going to do is look next year, once the dust has settled on Brexit, to see about relaunching in Europe. And obviously there are new marketplaces in Europe, Poland, Netherlands and Sweden. We've also sold in Amazon and Japan and Australia using FBA, but we stopped that due to local logistics at the time because the market for FBA was at its infancy. Again, we were going to revisit this next year to see if it's all much better, much more efficient and easier to do. Amazon Canada and Mexico is another market. We launched this in June 2021 using the North American remote fulfillment. So we've only been going a few months, but we've already seen good sales. So we could switch on ads and target these markets, and that should increase results. Another idea that I have was cross-offer promotions within our brands. Because our products are related to each other in different niches, I think that we can actually offer products to help promote each other. For example, we have a product for babies, so we could offer a discount for a beauty product so that the mum gets a treat too, for example. Another angle to look at is to launch more products. Now, we have four included brands which are well-established and cover multiple niches such as baby, beauty, pets and home. And this gives the owner a wide basis to find suitable products than a single niche alone. Well, it really sounds like you've got some major opportunities for growth that you've really thought out. And you had mentioned FBA fulfillment in Europe. Could you describe the process of getting the inventory to Amazon? Because I know with yours, it's a bit of a different situation. So are you referring to FBA in the UK, right? Or you're you're not talking about FBA in the US? Well, both, because you serve both markets, and I know it's a bit different. Right. Okay. Well, we have an excellent supplier who's based in the US. So he keeps all of our packaging. We ship all the packaging and bags and everything to him in the US. And what he does is he preps everything, wraps them all up in the way we want him to do it. And then he puts them in the box and sends it off to FBA in the US and typically is within the same state. So 
I think each box costs us something like, you know, three or four dollars, which is fantastic. If you consider some of the shipping costs of boxes generally. And that is usually because of where he's located. They can probably get it into stock within a week, although obviously that does depend on what backlog Amazon has. So that may not be the case always, but it is pretty efficient. And because of him being in the U.S., we sort of review our inventory every week so that we send them orders every week so that what we try to do is to strike a balance between being in stock at FBA, minimizing storage costs in Amazon by ordering more frequently with a supplier. For the UK, obviously the lead time is a little bit longer, but I think what we do is we send him the same weekly orders. It just depends on whether UK is involved at all. And if there's a UK shipment coming, then that normally, from us giving him the order, we normally will have it the following week. And what happens is that because we live in the UK, we receive it and we tend to order more than is needed at FBA because it doesn't make sense to keep sending these things across regularly. So we have it at our home. We can unpack them, but we don't because he supplies excellent. So what we do is we just store it ourselves. And then as and when it's required FBA, we get UPS to come and pick it up from our door and, and that's it. So that's simple. Now, when we sold in Europe before Brexit, we had the same procedure because it fulfilled from the UK. But because of Brexit and the new requirements are that you have to send it to fulfillment in the various warehouses within Europe, i.e. we could no longer fulfill them UK, is the reason why we stopped, because at that stage we weren't prepared to do that. But as I said before, next year we would look at it again. All right. No, that makes sense. So along with that, you were talking about receiving inventory, but otherwise, could you describe the amount and type of work that you do on this business for maintenance? Yeah, sure. My husband and I work about eight hours a week, thereabouts. I mean, it just sort of depends on what is required at that time. I mean, roughly, you know, daily, we'd look at any issues from customers or listings. Now, our VA monitors these and will let us know if there's any change in listings or whatever. On a weekly basis, we look have inventory management, so we just see what is available in the US and what the sales have been, UK as well, and then also look at the packaging inventory. Then we order from our supplier as is necessary, and we have a great template that we have set up so that to make it easier for the supplier, so that we just send this template and he's got it pinned up on his wall at his warehouse. And we liaise with his CPA for any sort of cash recs or updating records. And then there's other sort of ad hoc tasks, you know, customer queries, marketing, reviewing advertising, social media, research, etc. So just to say that our part-time VA who works about three to four hours a week, she handles the product listings, you know, graphic works, you know, sourcing the social media posts, which I would actually approve to make sure it's relevant, and other miscellaneous tasks. So that's basically our sort of our tasks in a nutshell. Okay, great. So what sort of skills or requirements are there for someone who's not familiar with the niche or the business model? An understanding of English and a desire to succeed is really all that's needed. Part of the SOP documents I have created will include detailed notes on the nature of the products and the categories in which they're in and anything particular explain the reason why we created these products or the demand we saw or any particular nuances. So the buyer doesn't have to worry because they'll be fully briefed. The supplier is also very supportive. And, you know, he suggests products as well. It's great. And, of course, he's an expert in this niche also. Okay. So what do you think are the biggest risks with this business that a buyer should be aware of? Keep Amazon happy is probably the biggest risk, I'd say. But by risk, that, that sounds like a sort of like as a scary thing is not. I think what it is, is it's absolutely essential to keep on top of changes in Amazon policies so that your account listings are not at risk. I mean, ultimately, Amazon wants you to sell with them, but they also have a lot of issues to try and get everyone to conform. So as an example, recently, I think they had an issue about pesticides, for example. So I think for the US buyers, they had to take an interview to make sure that you can not sell pesticides, but anything relating to what might be classified as a pesticide. Now, the reason I'm talking about it and how it refers to us is that, you know, I don't sell anything to do with pesticides. The products we sell are natural products. But because we use key terms like antibacterial, for example, Amazon may flag the product as a pesticide, even though it is completely the opposite. So when I issue these sort of rules, 
it is really important to really look at them and make sure that your listing is compliant because otherwise, you know, your listing could be at risk. I mean, in our case, everything's fine. It's not a problem. It's because you think that because we're natural products, they're not pesticides. You have to look much deeper and see what they are looking at. So, yeah, keep Amazon happy. Yeah, that's a really fair point, actually. Kind of along those lines, I was actually going to ask you if you have any advice to give our listeners about something that you wish you would have known when you started. Yeah, two things, really. First is to choose your suppliers carefully. For China factories, for example, look beyond their sales department banter and instead really look at the production departments, the procedures and their efficiencies. You know, there's so much information out there from all the sort of Amazon type groups, right? And you can read so much about what not to do or how to prevent something from happening. But the reality of the situation is that one cannot cover all angles. Okay. Now, to give you an example of something that didn't work for us, and it's like like a lesson learned, but all lessons are, are good things, right? We had a product which was a textile product, and we did all the right things. We got samples sent out, pre-production, post-production. We got inspectors in to some, I don't know, 50% of the what was produced. And we still had the problem, which actually in the end, we had to just throw the whole lot away. That was quite painful. So what happened was that this textile product, we had it packed in you know nice boxes and everything. And then they shipped it to LA port, right, by boat. Now, the problem was that they did not dry these things completely. They were very, very, very slightly damp. Now, the inspection people couldn't pick it up because they felt fine because it was so slight. But if you can imagine sitting on a boat for two months, nice and warm temperature, by the time it reached a port or by the time it actually went into FBA, at this stage, some of them might have been actually stored at a warehouse. And then they get, got to the end customer. They were moldy. It was horrible. And it was a terrible way to find out when something like this happened right that we had no choice we were in the uk we couldn't go through all of these to see what was right what was wrong so in the end we just had to just get rid of the whole lot so this is what i'm saying is that choose your suppliers carefully you know the sales department are very very nice they're very very helpful they'll say whatever it is but ultimately it's the production department how they treat customers will they just treat you the same as they treat someone who's going to order a lot more you know how they do things this is a difficult one But I think that, you know, by doing the proper due diligence, I mean, I thought we did the proper due diligence, but these are some things you just, it's difficult to pick up. So that's the first one. The second advice is that not all products are winners. When something doesn't work out, it is really to not be too gutted about the whole thing, although it really hurts, but it's really to learn from this. You know, there's always valuable information gained about why it went wrong, what did one do wrong, or even if it wasn't what you did wrong, then how can you try to at least cover that angle in the future? No, that's excellent advice, and what a learning experience. As we wrap up, I just have a few additional questions to ask you. Would you be willing to commit to a non-compete? Yes, we are. We are happy to commit to a non-compete for an agreed period, whatever the standard period might be. All right, great. And how much support are you offering buyers? We are happy to offer uh, two months email support and two Skype calls. However, if a buyer gives us an upfront first offer of the full price, we will offer more, such as four months email, six Skype calls, for example. Fantastic. And are you open to negotiating something like an earnout? We generally prefer a cash offer, but we are willing to consider an earnout. But this is really just depends on how it's structured. That's fair. And my final question is putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer. Why do you think this business is worth buying? Well, our products are good quality. They have been put together with a customer in mind and are well received because we have run and nurtured our accounts, taking great care, maintaining both excellent customer feedback and relationship with Amazon. Because we are selling this, because this is a good time in our lives to take a break, not because the business is not performing well. And because there's so much one can still do to grow the business, this for us is a lifestyle business and it can continue to run with a few hours input per week. We have a great engaged, supportive supplier who's eager to help grow the business. And him being based in the US, you know, facilitates faster turnaround times, lower transportation costs and is much more efficient. All right. Wonderful. Is there anything else you'd like to share that I might have missed? No, I think you've been pretty thorough in your questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Prudence. It's been great talking to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. 
To learn more and see if this listing has already been sold, head over to empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for listing 55464. If you're watching this on YouTube, click on the link in the description to go straight to the listing. Once you've unlocked this listing, you'll be given everything you need to know about this business. So until next time, enjoy your digital journey.